Okay then. Tuesday's Christmas. Yeah, you knew that. Butchers are busy. Supermarkets are delightful. Full anyway. Uh, the relatives have all turned up. The relatives all turned up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. All the ones you hope you get in. <laughs> yeah, the relatives have all turned up. Something great about it at the start, isn't it? Brilliant. And soon it's going to be time to pause and it's going to be time to look back over the year that has been. And maybe kind of look forward a little bit to the year that we think is in store. It's never quite like that, is it? Because you never quite know what it is that's going to be in store. So what will have changed going into that fresh year? What will have changed because of our Christmas? What will be different because of Christmas? <clears throat> we all at the Bible reading about Emmanuel, God with us. We looked last time we were here at the setting from which that prophecy of Isaiah sprang. The Old Testament history in which we find it. And we, we look at those bits and pieces from the British Museum that relate to it and so on, all the descriptions and stuff. But as a few of you probably know, I've been working my mind this Christmas around this question of just what it means for God to be with you. Did anybody get a chance to take that through a bit more after the last time? Did anybody carry on for me? <laughs> what does it mean for God to be with you? Practically, how does that work? I know a couple of us have had the sort of experience this week where it's been very important for us to know that God is with us. Uh, and maybe there are things we could come back and we could say, well, actually, next was end this week, and that could have been chaos, but, you know, God was with me in that, and that made a big difference for me. It's okay. <laughs> really, it is. If that thing goes beep beep, it just doesn't matter here. <laughs> You've got to understand that. <laughs> so, I've come to the conclusion, thinking that all through, that God with us touches on some fairly fundamental issues that most of us have had right from childhood. What do I mean? How many of us grew up with a haunting fear of getting lost and being left alone? You know, you little kid in the supermarket. There you are, wandering over mammy in the baskets. Yeah. Don't leave me. God is with us when we're no longer alone. There was a famous gang man leader called Mickey Crows that some of us will have read the book of uh, in New York in the 60s. And uh, that was a guy who was a bad guy. He was a gang leader and he killed people. And yeah, all that sort of thing, got the basic picture. A guy called David Wilkerson, a young minister, went there with a heart to do something for God. And he was a very, very traditional sort of churchy type person. And he got something with these, these gangs. And this guy, amongst others, became a Christian. Mickey Crows wrote the book. Most people have read Cross and the Switchblade, but how many people know about the book called Lonely, but Never Alone? Which goes through the whole analysis of where this guy was coming from psychologically when he was getting into all these gangs. And how the essential loneliness of that bottom of him led to his wanting to be involved in all these things. And how that changed when God came to be with him. So that, yeah, some days he'd be lonely, but he was never alone. And that thing in his heart that had driven him down in such a self-destructive and sociopathic way of dealing with that personal loneliness was met with as Christ came to be with him. No more alone. Mm. So there you are, as a small child, you're out in the supermarket with your mum and you're walking around hanging. Did you used to hang on to the basket? I used to hang on to the basket. You couldn't do that now. They've done something with the wheels on the trolleys. Have you noticed? So you hang on to the basket now, you get an electric shock. I don't know what they've done with these trolleys, but you know, used to go in the supermarket and hang it under the basket, and, and, and then there comes a day when something of mum's business in a bargain, and over there there's something far more exciting, you know, something bright and shiny, and you'd love to have one of those, and you sort of. And all of a sudden you find yourself lost. A little child running down the aisles with tears streaming, streaming down your face, and there's that fear of being alone, I'm alone in the world, and it's not a safe place. Still makes a hair on the back of your neck stand up, doesn't it? Mine's, mine's gone about now, actually. <laughs> a scary prospect for a little fella. Now, we live in a society that increasingly, that 
fear of being alone is becoming more, more and more and more a reality for people because we live in a society of increasingly ruptured fundamental relationships because of divorce, because of distance with the geographical mobility of labour, because of disappointment with one another. Increasingly we live in a society where people are finding themselves alone. Did anybody hear the, the Radio 4 appeal today? Did you hear that? Uh, it was that, that grumpy old man from that programme on the telly, which I can't remember. Um, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, uh, Victor Meldrew. That's it. Back there now. Victor Meldrew, he was making an appeal for a charity for lonely elderly people. Oh, well, they find themselves on their own. And you know what this charity does? It's very simple, very straightforward. It's a great idea. Once a month, a, a, an elderly, a lone person gets invited for Sunday tea in somebody's house. Right? Now, you think, it's not a lot, is it? But then to hear what the people who've been part of that were saying about it, you begin to realise how much of pressure, lonely and old, is for a lot of people. God with us means we're not going to be alone. Now there's more to it than that because that puts you in fellowship, that puts you in families, doesn't it? You know, God's the Father for the fatherless and he puts the orphans in families, doesn't he? And then, as a Christian, you, 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 with God you become part of the church. Emily was telling me about the church she's Found down in where are you Exeter, in the flooded zone down there somewhere, in the southwest, okay? And uh, you know, fantastic. She says, "Great, because they talk to you and they're nice to you, you know." Yeah, why not? The loneliness is banished by the communities that God creates, and so on and so on. So it's a problem we know. It's a problem we know about this loneliness. God with you is there to deal with that. But there's a far deeper source of a quiet, uneasy fundamental loneliness at the heart of our society than, than just that. Because here we are living in a world that cries out for there to be a creator. Cries out for there to be somebody there. But so many of us have found ourselves cut off from him. Um, <clears throat> CERN, big thing on the telly, on radio or something again this week, couldn't have been the telly, it must have been the radio in the car or we driving somewhere. A big thing again from, from CERN, the laboratory CERN, and they, they, there's this big search going on for the Higgs boson, right? Which I understand, like I understand the inner workings of a Formula One racing engine, right? I don't understand it, but I have an idea. This is the key they're looking for to support the current model for the world, the universe, and everything. They're looking for this key issue. And we're actually stuck here, you know, waiting for Godo sort of thing. In a world centered on a core person who seems to be missing, they're looking for the God particle, but actually, the one who holds it together for us is God with us. Emmanuel. A hope of glory. Very famously somebody said a long time ago, you made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. There's that empty alone. And God with us changes that. When God comes to be with us, that's changed. The relationship is restored and the little child lost is now saved and found and protected and God with us is the one who makes the change. God with us impacts that fundamental issue we've got in our society and it's a big one and it's costing society quite a lot as well as individuals quite a lot too. No more alone, no more in the dark. I do like the dark. I've grown to like the dark, but I didn't like it to start with. And I don't like total dark. I like there to be stars in the sky. Do you know what I mean? It's a big theme of Isaiah, so Isaiah 9 famously speaks about the people who walk in darkness having seen a great light. Are not living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. For to us a child is born. That's why. To us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counsel, and Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. He's more than a baby. He's more than a baby. The government will be on his shoulder, and that's where light dawns for you. That's where light comes into your darkness, when he comes to reign and rule, <coughs> and put things in their place. Now, okay, what's darkness then? Darkness. What's darkness? Well, we all know what darkness is, don't we? Yeah, of course we do. Mm. Uh, and then you try and define it. Of course, it's a natural situation, isn't it? You go out into space, and uh, there in chaos, it's 
Pridah. Darkness is the absence of light. It's not so much a thing, it seems to me, but the absence of something it'd be good to have there, you know? There's something missing. There's not much life without light. There's no security, because you can't see so well, can you? Yeah, imagine being a blind man trying to cross Regent Street. You've never seen that sort of thing. You can't see, and it's a risky situation to be in, isn't it? Not to be able to see. To have no light. Life becomes a bit of a lottery, and you spend quite a lot of time waiting for the bus to arrive. You know what I mean? You might be at the bus stop, but you might be in the middle of the street. Again, it's a fundamental human fear from, from childhood. I had a kitty light when I was a kid. Did you have one of those plastic lights? I had a noddy one. <laughs> it was noddy in his car. Up inside was a sort of a 15 watt bulb or something. Just couldn't get to sleep with, with, with a bit of light on. Very early age, kitty light. Calling out in the dark. You were afraid of what might be there. And without Christ, human life, art, literature, philosophy is like a child calling out in the dark for somebody to be there. Or not. It's a situation of sensing your own vulnerability because the dark conceals threats and the dark conceals dangers. It conceals many a thing that's not actually there, but we're afraid of anyway because we can't see that it's not. see, you do tend to be vulnerable. And it leaves you in a state of um, confusion. Because you can't see the way. You don't know what's there. Don't see the reality, so you don't understand it. Leaves you floating in a sea of confusion and disorientation. Now, of course, that anybody else would know. <clears throat> you become socially very capable of pretending that we've got this together. We've got it together, we're cool. There we stand, pretending in the dark, and here comes Jesus, the light of the world, banishing the darkness. And the first thing that shows up is we're pretty, pretty weak and vulnerable. So Emmanuel, God with us, addresses those issues. But as he comes with his light, he shows up things that we've been successfully hiding perhaps for a while. He comes and he basically addresses things that eat at the, at the things that decay the quality and the values of life. But as he comes, he comes with light. And the light shines in the darkness and the light reflects back at you off the cobwebs of the things that have been happening in your life until now. And here, perhaps more than anywhere else, our actual fundamental problem might not be quite as we've assessed it before, because God with us shows up these issues. How destructive, for all that matters, is human guilt? Now, <clears throat> of course, it makes you personally feel bad, doesn't it? It can eat away at you. Guilt is not dealt with. It can eat away at you. No question about that. Of course it eats away at you personally, it makes you feel bad. But what it also does, in, in, in my experience, is this, I've seen this time and again, it gives you responses that really don't help in your life. It gives you perhaps defensiveness and what looks like spikiness and an aggression as you snap back at people in self-defense. Because you know there's something wrong, they don't know that yet, you're pretending still, okay? But, but they can't work out why you're being so spiky. It wrecks relationships and it ruins lives and it, it makes God with us to blot out guilt. It makes that look a very good option indeed. Again, fear of, of guilt is a fundamental human thing from childhood, isn't it? Who wants to be a bad boy? Girl. We all want to be good boys and girls, don't we? It was something really odd on the telly that Caleb was watching when I walked into the room last week with a little boy who, who didn't want Father Christmas to come because he'd seen Father Christmas kissing mummy on Christmas Eve. And it was Daddy dressed up, you know, you get the picture. And it was actually Thanksgiving. So, so he, he realised that if, um, if he was a bad boy, Santa wouldn't come, because he'd been told. So he went around trying to be a bad boy so that Santa wouldn't come, so that, you know, Santa wouldn't have enough day with mummy and, you know, 
this made a film which entertained for a while. I have anything to do with it, to be honest. But it took a month for it to be so naughty, and then Santa still came. There you go, there you, Santa still came, because he lived there. Uh, but <laughs> still, you see the general problem. This little boy was trying to be bad, and that was just such an aberration. You walk in the room, he glares at you, because most kids don't want to do that. You don't want to be in a guilty position. You don't want to be there. It's a fear we've had from childhood. You know, the drink driving ads this Christmas. Have you seen those? I briefly saw one or two drink driving ads this Christmas. And they're all getting this fundamental human fear. We don't want to be guilty of that. It's that guilt that drives the, the philosophical and the moral relative, relativism of our era, which says it doesn't, you know, there isn't right and wrong. You can't tell me it's right and wrong, it's my decision. Because the trouble with right and wrong is you can't live without it. You can't live without right and wrong. If you're going to live with other people in society, then you've got to have some clear idea of where the barriers are, where the boundaries are. You've got to know what's going to be right and what's going to be wrong in that situation. You've got to know where you are with that. Um, a story I've told many times about my, my tutor at university who, who, uh, who was arguing this, this case that there's no such thing as right and wrong, it's all sort of relative. You know? uh, and I was having a tutorial before dinner with one of the college lads <coughs> that came about and uh, just looked at each other, we got absolutely annoyed with this line of argument with our essays and stuff, looked at each other, got up, walked off and helped ourselves to a sherry. At which he, he protested because this was wrong. No, it's not wrong to us, we're fine. Thanks for the sharing. See the point? You need a moral compass, or you can't live in society. You can't live without right and wrong. The trouble with that is, we can't live without it, but you can't live with it either. You can't live with it either, because the trouble for most of us with right and wrong is that we simply can't live with stuff. And the big point about God with us is that he came to address this issue. God with us comes to address that issue, an issue we don't reckon on as being our biggest of problems, but that every day causes us so much of our grief. The sin that makes guilt has got very big consequences in the world we live in, the world that we inhabit. And God coming with us and being for us is transformative. God comes with us to address all these things, day by day, street level stuff. Heaven comes down to be with us for these things, to address these very issues. So you won't be alone. You'd be amazed. The big, strong, capable guys had that conversation with him. So we're not in the dark. You'd be amazed. Apparently, very, very worked out, sorted people had that conversation with them. Guilty. Again, Christ comes down to address these issues, to be God with us, and as if to say, come on, we can sort this out. Let's get back on track here. I'll be with you. How? How did that come about? Very, very briefly. Our fundamental problem, of course, is as, as, as we've been defining it. Very common in this life to find our fundamental problems are not quite what we think they are. Everybody's got an analysis of what would make the absolute difference so that their life was completely different. Well, God comes along and he says this, the big problem is you've been without me. You've been without me. Here's the key to it, here's the fundamental building block, and you've just taken your, you've taken your little Lego block and you've lobbed it. He's missing. And all these things are the things that follow. What's he going to do about that? Well, he's going to come and bear our nature. We know that's what Christmas is about, don't we? Because you know, God became man and there he is in the pot on the stable thing. It's called manger. That's the word I'm looking for. I should go that way now. And there he is in the manger and you know, he's with us and he's bearing our human nature. Can you imagine what that must be like? I mean, just take this through a minute. What we're saying here is that God becomes a baby, yeah? God. God who knows what it's like to fly with the angels comes and, you know, learns to crawl. Takes up our nature. What a sacrifice is that? He who knew the tongues of men and of angels subjected himself to Hebrew classics. 
something for them. That's a big deal, you know. They must love me quite a lot. A big trivial, but it's such a significant constraint on him. What he gives up. To take upon himself our human nature, because there were things we were too weak to give up ourselves. Until he comes be with us and starts sorting the deal out. Came and bore our nature. Came and bore our temptation. We, we don't reckon on that. You don't hear that much, do you? You know, Jesus is coming to ultimately die on the cross for our sins, right? Now, if he's got sins of his own to die for, that's it, he's dealing with his own debt. But if he's going to be able to deal with my debt, he's got to be debtless to start with, isn't he? That makes sense in English? Right. Okay, just tell me if it doesn't, because I'm tired too, and I think wrong, right? So, he's got to be debtless. So, if he's going to be debtless, he's got to be without sin. But if he's not tempted, he can't be without sin the way we you know, should have been and haven't been. If he's going to pay the price for our sin by his death, then he's going to have to be not only counted as righteous, but unrighteousness should have had to have been a very live option as well. He bore all the sort of temptation that we do, and he did it so that he could bear all our sin. And if he hadn't done, he wouldn't have been able to. And he came bearing our sin. Bearing our nature, bearing our temptation, bearing our sin. He's more than a babe. Because most babes are born and will die. Right? You don't have to think that, do we? You don't think that way, do you? Most came and will die, but he came to die. To pay the price of my sin. To take away that alienation from God that I can't actually live with. To pay the price of my sin so that I can be reunited with God. To be God with me now. Not against me. Conquering death. Conquering death. You know, it was when sin entered the world that death came in here too. And it's not biology that determines your disease, but theology. There are people out there trying to work on ways to, you know, make us live longer. Perish the thought. Um, with this sort of life, you know. It's not biology that determines your disease, it's theology. The wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, as we're pulled back in to the relationship we should have had all along with our Creator. What difference does it make then for Jesus to be Emmanuel, to be God with us? So get plugged back in again, isn't it? Back into where we should be, back into the relationship, the fundamental relationship that colours and equips for the rest of our lives. Having paid the price of sin, sin's wages all disappear, which is good, because sin earns you the very things you really don't want. The very things you don't want. And you know, we've come to Christmas and we've been thinking about babies and we've sung away in a manger. Yeah, got that one in pretty early on. You've got to clear that out the way, haven't you? We've done that stuff, but bear this in mind. He's much more than a babe. He's much more than a nice little story for the kiddies. He's so much more than the subject matter for the nativity play, which we all enjoy. He is the one who comes to deal, to be God with us, to deal with the alone, to deal with the dark, to deal with the guilty, to deal with things that eat away at and destroy from the inside rebellious human life. Remember the government was on his shoulder. Remember he came to be king. And ever since, that fall of the sin in the first place, people have been saying, we will not have this man to rule over us. That's where it's all come from. That's where the problems arise. And that's where the loneliness and the darkness and the guilt and the sheer frustration, the disruption of all that will be good in our lives stems. And that's why one has come to be God with us 
Bapak Ibu Tuhan. Thanks for your patience.